Hello, welcome back to another video and last time we were looking at presence and specifically just an introduction into the concept whereas this time we're going to dive straight into the doctrine itself and it's also sometimes known as a sham. So let's get straight into it. So what is a pretense? What is pretense? Lord Templeman and Street said, although the rent acts must not be allowed to alter or influence the construction of an agreement, the court should, in my opinion, be astute to detect and frustrate sham devices and artificial transactions whose only object is to disguise the grant of a tenancy and to evade the rent acts. So this is the original definition and there's not really much guidance here as to what exactly a sham is, but more guidance was given as to what it was in the next case, and that is here Antoniades and Villiers. The House of Lords held that a contractual provision is a pretense if it does not reflect the substance and reality of the transaction, it was never seriously intended in fact, and the parties do not regard it as a provision to which any effect would be given. So remember from our previous video well, why we were looking at pretence and why exactly it arised and it was really to circumvent the, the rent acts to make sure that the landowners could sort of classify those who are in who are living on their premises are going to be known as licenses licensees rather than tenants because they didn't want them to have the protection of the rent act and they used loads of different sort of devices um, shams to try and circumvent the rent acts and this case is saying that you know a certain contractual provision that sort of aims to circumvent the rent act will be a pretense if you know we have any of these three situations listed out in this case here Pretence is legally disregarded. Any contractual provision held to be a pretence is removed from the occupation agreement. So it is severed from the relevant agreement. It is, it's once, you know, it's completely removed from that agreement. It's ignored. Once all pretences have been disregarded, the true agreement is revealed. So if you've got a, uh, a contract which has a pretence or a sham device in it, so it'll circumvent the rent act, that would just be disregarded. And then once that's been disregarded, that is the true agreement that was held between the parties. So let's talk about establishing pretence. Inferred intent. The House of Lords in Antoniades held that a contractual provision is a pretence if at the time of contracting, the parties did not intend it to be acted upon. And although this references a plural like parties here, it's really on about the key intent, the intent of the owner, okay, sorry, the landowner. That's the real intent that the court is concerned about. And it's not really interested in the intent of the parties as such. And also it's about at the time of the contracting parties drew up the contractual agreement. So be aware of those sort of particular points from what the court held in this case. And the court have prepared to infer the intent necessary to establish pretence, okay? So they can just infer that intent. Grant a third party occupation. In a number of cases, the court have inferred that a provision relating to grant a third party occupation was not intended to be acted upon at the time of contracting and is therefore a pretence. Factors include the layout of the property and the way in which the agreement has operated in practice have been relied upon to support such inferences. So these are factors that we can take into account when deciding that the landowner did or did not intend the provision to be acted upon. I think I should quickly discuss the Antioniadis case just so that you got a clear understanding of how that case operated. So in that case, Mr. Antoniades uh, gives a couple occupation of his flat and Mr. Antoniades inserts into the agreement a provision relating to sharing occupation with strangers at some point in the future, you know, a third party clause. So prima facie, there is no exclusive possession. We saw that from my previous videos. So 
But, you know, the court did not stop there. Uh, they asked themselves the question, is this clause, the clause to allow for the potential future sharing of occupation, a presence? Is this an intention that's actually going to be acted upon? This is the question. So in the absence of explicit evidence, the court looked to see whether it could infer intent. And the court felt able to infer no intention for the provision to be acted upon and therefore dismiss it as pretense and disregarded it as a provision in the agreement. And the factors that they really took into account here were the layout of the property. I mean, the property was a one bedroom flat, so the clause did seem a little bit surprising. And they also took into account the way in which the agreement had operated in practice. He had never actually tried to introduce a new occupant and take advantage of the clause itself. So these factors enabled the court to decide it was not seriously intended, um, that this clause was not seriously intended. It was a pretense and should be removed from the agreement. Okay, So that should give you an understanding of how this sort of pre how pretense really operates and how the court approaches pretense in practice. So let's give an example from Blackacre. So Claire is a registered proprietor of the registered freehold estate in Blackacre. On the 25th of May 2013, she entered into an agreement with Bill, granting him an immediate right to occupy Blackacre Barn for a period of two years, at a monthly rent of £1,000. Clause 4 of the agreement stipulates that Claire is entitled to remove into the barn and occupy alongside Bill at any point during his two-year residency. Blackacre Barn comprises a small bedroom, bathroom and kitchen come living room. Claire has not yet taken advantage of her right to move in with Bill. Is clause four a pretense? So this screams lease versus license, okay? So, and it's all about the intention of the landowner. Did Claire intend clause four would be acted upon on, upon contracting? And like in the case of Aslan and Murphy, which I would recommend you have a little look at, we have no express evidence, okay? So we need to, inf can we infer the relevant intent? And the, f the main factor here probably is the layout which of the house, um, which makes this, or the barn I should say, makes this, sort of makes this clause seem unlikely. In practice, Claire had not taken advantage of the right either, so... Based on these factors, we can infer that Claire did not intend the provision to be acted upon. And if we can infer this, we can legally conclude that Clause 4 is a pretense, so it can be removed from the occupation agreement. Okay. Likewise, in a number of cases, the court has inferred that a provision reserving extensive access to the grantor was not intended to be acted upon at the time of contracting and is therefore a pretense. Again, the way in which the agreement has operated in practice has been relied upon in support uh, to support such inference. Thus, in Aslan and Murphy, there was such clause in the agreement. If I let me just talk about Aslan and Murphy actually here. So, in Aslan and Murphy, Murphy was the occupant of a basement room. It was actually a very small basement room, about four foot by twelve foot. Um, now, within the occupation agreement itself, it said that there was a provision for third parties to join him in occupation or potential for third parties to join him in occupation. And so the project of the court was the same as what we saw in Antoniades. The court came to the same conclusion that based on the factors together, that the fact that, you know, you, he's got a small room yet, there's a provision for him to, for, for someone to come in and occupy that room alongside him, it it must have been a pretense. So yeah, the, the court dismissed that provision as a pretense. So, in with regards to the extensive grantor access, this prima facie would deny the occupant exclusive possession. But, of course, no services were provided in practice despite the clause in place. The court took note of that and inferred there was no intent to act upon it so the pretence could be removed. So that's how, you know that operated with regards to Aslan and Murphy and, you know, offering extensive grant access doesn't necessarily mean it's going to undermine the agreement that they should have in place. So they can remove the presence, they can remove the sham device that is in place. So Blackacre example. 
Claire is the registered proprietor of the registered freehold estate in Blackacre. On the 25th of August 2014, she entered into an agreement with Bill, granting him an immediate right to occupy Blackacre Barn for a period of two years at a monthly rent of £1,000. Clause 5 of the agreement stipulates that Claire will come to the barn daily at a time of her choosing to clean. When Claire and Bill signed the occupation agreement, Claire told Bill, I wouldn't have, have included the cleaning clause were it not for the rent acts, but I'll certainly clean now. Bill moved into the barn on the 26th of August. On the same day Claire fell and broke her hip, she is still in recovery and has not yet provided any cleaning services. Is clause 5 a presence? Okay, so I'm actually going to let you think about this one yourself. Um, so I, I don't usually do this, so I, I, if, you, if you don't like the way I'm about to do this, then you know, shout at me in the comments below. But I want you guys to try and have a go at answering this question yourself and putting your answers in the comment section. And I will, I will essentially give you the answers in due course. So if any of you guys want to have a go at this question, write your answers below or send us an email and... I will get back to you and tell you what the right answers are. So have a go at that one and see whether you can follow the right chain of thinking. Okay, and multiple occupancy. Multiple occupancy and exclusive possession. There can only be a single right exclusively to possess a given piece of property. Therefore, multiple occupants will be in exclusive possession only if they hold this right, single right as joint tenants. Multiple, multiple occupants are joint tenants if they satisfy the four unities. So we've already seen this in the previous videos and I would encourage you to check that out. But you can, you know, if you want to be multiple occupancies and to be in possession of the land uh, as joint tenants, then you must satisfy the four unities. Okay, otherwise you won't have, you, you won't have uh, exclusive possession. You won't have that possession of the land. And then lack of joint tenants, tenancy a pretence. The courts have been prepared to disregard as pretence any circumstances or contractual terms preventing the conclusion that multiple occupants are joint tenants of a single right. The court will conclude that a lack of joint tenancy is a pretence if at the time of contracting the landlord intended to confer rights on multiple occupants as a single unit. This intention will be inferred if at the time of contracting, the multiple occupants were an independent entity and the landowner knew this to be the case. Okay, so interdependent, sorry, is the key word here. And then the parties will be held to be joint tenants after all. I think the best way for me to explain this is to look at how this worked in Antoniades. So we had a couple here who signed separate occupation agreements and under the agreements each of them agreed to pay half of the total rent so prima facie the couple could only be licensees and not tenants because multiple occupants can only be tenants if they satisfy the four unities as we see here and here there was no unity of title and no unity of interest but the court went further they said is the lack of joint tenancy a pretense at the time of contracting, had Mr. Antoniades intended to confer rights on the couple, multiple occupants, as a single unit? So this was the question that was being asked. And the court used this idea of interdependence. Okay. They stressed that multiple occupants were a couple and had been. Um, so they, they stressed that these two people, the multiple occupants here, were a couple and they had been for uh, a while when the occupation agreement was entered and the landlord knew of their status as a couple. So the court considered it crucial that they were a couple and therefore interdependent and could be considered as a single unit and that Mr. Antoniades was aware of this. So on that basis, the court could infer that Mr. Antoniades had intended to confer rights on the couple as a single unit. Therefore, the lack of joint tenancy was simply a pretense. It was a sham device, okay? Then any circumstance or contractual term inconsistent with joint tenancy is therefore legally disregarded. They were held to be joint tenants after all, and therefore um, they were uh, they had the right to exclusive possession of the flat. Okay? So I think that sums up pretense now. 
I think some people do struggle with this topic and I can I can sort of see why, but really the essence of it is the court are looking to see whether or not there is some contractual device which is just in conflict with the intention of the parties uh, and therefore should be disregarded. Now, if you have any questions about this one, then please get back to me in the comments below and I will get back to you. And make sure you have a go at that Blackacre example that we that was on the slide a couple of minutes ago and leave your answers in the comment section and I will give you my response as soon as I can. So give it a go. It's the best way to learn is to practice problem questions and to answer essay questions. So yeah. Anyway, I hope you check in and tune in next time. So make sure you subscribe to my channel and give this a thumbs up. Thank you very much for watching.